and welcome to the 10th session of the Financial History Webinar Series. Today, we have the pleasure of welcoming Manuel Bautista Gonzalez, who is a financial historian of the United States and Mexico, currently finishing a doctoral dissertation in US history at Columbia University in the city of New York, titled King Cotton and His Mexican Pesos, the circulation of Mexican silver dollars and monetary plurality in antebellum New Orleans, uh, 1839 to 1862. Manuel is a lecturer in economic history at the Center for Research and Teaching in Economics, CIDE, a public research university in Mexico, a consult consultant with the Winthrop Group, and a consultant with Cash Essentials, a think tank and debate platform on the future of cash, the payments, and monetary ecosystems. So Manuel will present his paper today titled Boat Loads of Mexican Silver, the Political Economy of Specie Imports to New Orleans, 1839 to 1861. So Manuel is going to present for about 30 minutes and then we are going to uh, open the floor for questions. You can either raise your hands or place your questions in the chat and I'm going to read it to Manuel. So thank you so much, Manuel, for being with us here today and I give the floor to you. Thank you very much, Paula. Um, it is a pleasure to present in the uh, webinar series, uh, although we, we, we wish um, uh, the original session had taken place, uh, but uh, so I will start sharing my screen now. Uh, my th this paper is based on my the my dissertation's first chapter. Um, the idea is to um, make it, um, you know, transform it from a dissertation chapter into an article. Um, so any comment that you all have will be welcome for it. Um, are, are you seeing the screen now? Yes. Yes. Very good. Uh, so my plan for uh, today's presentation is to um, state the problem and look at the literature on it, um, look at the sources that one can um, uh, use if, if we are to reconstruct the specie market um, in the United States. And for that matter, I say, I, I would think any other city in the 19th century Atlantic economy. Uh, then I'm going to look at the findings uh, uh, out of the data set that I have assembled in terms of the amounts of uh, silver and gold coins uh, imported to New Orleans, the regions on ports of origin, uh, the means of transportation, uh, a profile of the consignees of specie, and then some, uh, some particular profiles. As I am aware, some of you have seen this presentation before, uh, and well, I, I thank you for being um, here again. So the question um, leading this uh, dissertation research is, uh, what is the role of specie in the early American economy. Um, so most that we know uh, from, from commodity money and specie in this time uh, has to do with uh, how it was a reliable yet scarce uh, means of payment in uh, the United States. Uh, early on from colonial times, um, the United States uh, imported, sorry, the, the, the English colonies then, then uh, the United States uh, after independence, imported a great deal of uh, uh, Spanish American silver pesos. And uh, these pesos were used as a means of payment. Um, so the role of specie is that uh, specie was the highest quality and high powered money and thus uh, looking at it and looking at its flows uh, and correlating it with other variables such as banking performance and then macroeconomic performance uh, could give us some insights into how uh, what economists call the monetary base or age um, impacts uh, the monetary supply and thus it might become an explanatory variable for um, aggregate macroeconomic performance. 
Uh, however, and in spite of these uh, systemic importance, uh, most of the scholars have looked into uh, the question of fiat monies in this period. Uh, the United States has a lot of uh, banknotes uh, being issued by state banks. There are also a lot of uh, monetary, uh, uh, sorry, of instruments with monetary uh, purposes that are not necessarily money, uh, sometimes called sheen plasters. There is, of course, uh, instruments of uh, credit, such as drafts uh, for international exchange, um, for international trade and finance, you have bills of exchange. And then, of course, you have uh, titles of, uh, um, of other financial instruments, such as shares and bonds. And so the question is, why uh, haven't scholars looked at uh, fluctuations in, in specie um, with, with greater detail? The question becomes even more interesting when one answer, when one looks into the issue of uh, factor endowments. So the United States had uh, really no um, uh, mining wealth uh, of consideration until after the war against Mexico, uh, which leads to the annexation of California. And thus, uh, the question of what was happening before and what happened after uh, becomes interesting enough to merit uh, further exploration. So um, the way I approach a problem is uh, by understanding that if Americans didn't have specie and if Americans didn't have um, mines, they needed to import this specie. So I, question, I, I look at specie imports as a reflection of US and Atlantic trade dynamics. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, since colonial times, uh, the early English uh, uh, occupants and well, the, the English colonists in, the, in North America uh, depended on their imports of uh, Spanish American silver pesos uh, to satisfy their needs uh, for specie. And there are several scholars who have looked into uh, this question at uh, different, um, from different perspectives. Now, the main supplier of this specie uh, for the period uh, that I look into uh, is, is Mexico. And this has to do with uh, two issues. One, uh, proximity, and then the other is factor endowments in Mexico. So Mexico's main export commodity is silver, uh, and this is, again, from colonial times. Uh, and then uh, the issue here is that we don't really know how silver uh, got to the United States, aside from um, certain collaborative um, evidence that has been pu pushed forward. So we don't know uh, who is bringing this uh, species. So the question then becomes one of how can we best measure or study uh, this, this phenomenon? There are um, three um, possibilities that I think of. So one is national statistics. The problem with national statistics is that at this particular point in time, they are rather um, macro, and so they don't provide much texture uh, into the actual origins of, of specie. And uh, the question of who was intermediating this specie gets obviated once one looks at uh, the trade uh, st statistics from this period. Then the second possibility is the documentary record and the numismatic and notophilic evidence. So I'm going, to, I'm going to mention those two in a little bit. Um, so then I, I had to figure out which place I'm going to be looking at um, as it would become um, very difficult to do a reconstruction for the whole period uh, for uh, several ports. I went with New Orleans and New Orleans is quite interesting at the time because it is a main uh, Southern trade port and financial center. Uh, it is a center for marketing, distribution, and finance of the main uh, U.S. Southern export uh, that is cotton. Yet, it is also an important marketplace for other uh, tropical commodities, one would say now, uh, arriving from um, the U.S. South, such as tobacco, um, uh, some, some sugar and molasses, uh, other tropical commodities from Mexico, Cuba, and even Brazil. Uh, such as coffee. 
So this is a very interesting port of trade as it is connecting the global north with the global south. Um, this is just a map that sort of exemplifies what kind of commodities are um, arriving and leaving uh, New Orleans um, in the years between, I would say, 1820s and uh, 1860s. Uh, you can see that the that the port becomes a place uh, for um, market making in these products. So the other type of evidence that one can take a look at is um, legal records. There are plenty of notarized contracts in uh, New Orleans. New Orleans has notaries because of the French heritage there. Uh, and so we have several of these contracts that uh, state the way in which people paid um, for uh, houses and real estate. So these contracts are uh, very um, um, elaborate in the sense that they, they, they do tell us if people paid uh, for a house in cash or using credit, uh, paying with shares and notes, because at this time, shares and bonds have uh, monetary-like uh, purposes. The other body of evidence is numismatic evidence. So uh, numismatists have uh, told me several times, you know, I have this Mexican silver dollar and it has a little seal from the New Orleans uh, branch mint, uh, the, the New Orleans uh, US branch mint. And so I guess one could take a look at all of those surviving coins and um, try to assert, well, this is the number of coins we have by year. And so we're assuming, well, we can do this by year. And, 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 um, but that would have a lot of survivorship bias. Uh, another possibility is the Notophily um, uh, documentary record, uh, banknotes. And there are plenty of banknotes that have uh, representations of the uh, Spanish silver dollar. Uh, such as these three that I'm, I'm showing you here. Uh, but they don't really tell us, you know, if these banks had um, 100 Spanish dollars or 100,000 Spanish dollars in their assets, right? So given all that, I did find us, um, a source that can give us more insights into um, the specie imports. That is a um, newspaper, a business newspaper called the New Orleans Price Current. Several of you might be aware of how important price currents uh, from the early modern period are for um, economic historians. Uh, what I was really surprised when I took a look at this uh, record uh, was the level of uh, detail that it provides on uh, species remittances from all over. Um, to New Orleans. So an example here is um, this uh, imports by Z section. It not only gives information on um, the imports of commodities such as salt, coffee, tobacco, but most interestingly, it does provide information on the amount of species, the type of species, and usually the consignees of uh, this species. So then I thought, well, you know, you could, you could definitely uh, help uh, and, and use um, this body of, of evidence uh, in as far as you uh, have it captured uh, in a data set. So this is what I'm going to present to you today. I assembled a data set from this uh, semi-weekly business newspaper. It accounts for 10,037 shipments. Um, of uh, 106 million uh, dollars in specie imports value uh, to New Orleans. Um, the data set has enough data to identify consignees for uh, nearly 65% of, um, um, of these flows. Now, even if it doesn't identify all of the consignees, uh, there is enough data um, regarding the origin of these uh, species imports regarding the type of species imports, whether they were gold or silver 
or whether they were coming from a port that was mainly trading in, in gold or silver. So even if we don't have enough information to identify, uh, you know, nearly 35% of uh, the consignees, we do have enough information to sort of make a profile of who these consignees might be. Um, so most of the species in this period was coming in from a Texan port that is long gone now, uh, Brazo Santiago. Uh, then New York appears as the second largest uh, port of imports uh, of specie. Then two Mexican ports, Veracruz and Tampico, and then Havana. Now, interestingly, Brazo Santiago doesn't really have any silver mines nearby, at least not on the U.S. border. And what is happening here is that a lot of the uh, species that is arriving from Brazo Santiago actually originates in the north of Mexico, in the mines of northern Mexico. Uh, and it is arriving to this destination due to smuggling uh, contraband and some legal trade. So um, just to see it from a spatial perspective, um, Brazo Santiago seems even bigger than Veracruz and Tampico in terms of the imports uh, onto New Orleans. But Brazo Santiago, in fact, is not reflecting so much what is happening in Southern Texas, in as much as it is reflecting what is happening in Northern Mexico, and in as much as it is reflecting the smuggling and contraband and legal trade that is happening in the US-Mexican borderlands. So uh, we need to be cautious when looking at uh, national level statistics for species in this period, because here we would think, oh, this species that is arriving to New Orleans must be coming in from California. It isn't. It is Mexican species being sent uh, to the borderlands, through the borderlands to a port and then uh, sent to New Orleans. So the main, the three main ports, four main ports out of five, except in New York, uh, that are uh, exporting specie to New Orleans are located in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so I have already explained to you what's happening with Brazo Santiago. Veracruz uh, is the longstanding uh, port that exports uh, Mexican silver to the world uh, coming in from colonial times. And then Tampico rises in the 19th century uh, after independence as a rival to Veracruz. Then there is some species coming in from Havana. Uh, what kind of um, uh, ships and maritime and new transportation vessels were being used to transport this uh, species? Most of the species was being brought in by steamships. These steamships made the route between Brazo Santiago and Tampico and Veracruz onto New Orleans. Then there were some schooners too, and the ships that are bringing in uh, specie from New Orleans are uh, ships that are making the longer uh, routes, uh, such as some specie imports coming in from Europe, some specie uh, coming in from New, York, from, from New York is actually uh, being transported uh, by ships. Uh, the main regions that uh, are providing this specie are ports in the Gulf of Mexico with yellow and the US North and by US North, we basically mean New York. The imports of specie by type of consignee, uh, after I assembled the lists of consignees and I classified it, um, I had uh, an idea of how many of these specie imports were consigned to firms, how many to individuals, and then some other categories to account for the unidentified consignees. Most of the specie in this period is being brought in uh, to the firms, uh, but firms at this period are mostly partnerships. So then it becomes um, imperative to look at who these individuals behind these partnerships are. And I see that Susie uh, has arrived. So um, I, here I have to acknowledge her for uh, her inspiration in, um, in doing, pursuing this uh, identification strategy. Uh, so once I aggregate on the on the one hand um, the specie imports uh, made at the firm level with uh, and then uh, correlated with the individuals who are um, the main partners in each partnership, 
we have that most of the species being brought into New Orleans uh, was carried on by uh, a collection of uh, Americans and foreigners. There are Spanish people here, there are French people here, there are Germans here, there are some US Northern um, agents, and then there's also um, some uh, Scotsmen and Irishmen. So the interesting thing here is that most of the people who are importing species, and perhaps not surprisingly now that I think about it, uh, are actually foreigners. Uh, that is nearly 46% of the people who we can identify in the data set are foreigners. And this um, is actually um, superior to the combined value of the imports being brought in by Americans and by banks and other financial entities, namely the US Mint and some express companies operating in the port in this period. So then this is the way in which I move in uh, from looking at you know, the, the question of macroeconomic aggregates that are more of interest of uh, economists and economic historians. And then I move on to the issues uh, of uh, entrepreneurship and social networks that are uh, more under the purview of business and financial historians. Uh, now, as you can see here, and we consider the yellow uh, ports in the Gulf of Mexico region, not all of these people uh, were sourcing the species uh, from ports in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Gulf of Mexico region. So I wanted to take a look at who are actually bringing in and who are the leaders in bringing in species from ports outside of the Gulf of Mexico region. And that gives us a rather different uh, perspective. So these people who are bringing in uh, from uh, ports in the US North, from Europe, from the French and the British Caribbean, they are rather different and more known to uh, US economic and financial historians. So then uh, the question becomes one of what is happening in, in, in this regard so that the people who um, are more better known to US historians are overrepresented in the literature and what is happening to the people uh, who are bringing in species to uh, New Orleans from the Gulf of Mexico. Why aren't they so uh, studied? And then the question becomes one of, well, how can you retrace the, um, the, the, the profiles, the biographic um, and, and business uh, trajectories of these individuals? Uh, then I fo basically followed case, uh, case studies of, of uh, these uh, top tier uh, consignees, plus the ones who are bringing most, more, more species from these other regions, and uh, basically assembled a, a profile of, of them, sort of a collective biography. Most of them were uh, so-called commission merchants, and here I thank Miguel for letting me know that uh, I should maybe uh, explain this at the later uh, at a bigger uh, detail, uh, commission merchants who are not entirely merchant bankers, but they could actually uh, be very um, well understood as merchant bar bankers of a smaller size. They are not as well known as the Barings, the Rothschilds, uh, the Brown Brothers, but these people are mostly doing that. They are advancing merchandise on credit uh, and then they're getting a uh, specie on. Um, in exchange. Now, some of them move on to banking and finance properly. Some of them move on to exchange operations. Uh, but most of them are actually factors and dealers in cotton and then some other commodities. So now I'm going to just briefly mention who these people are and the consequences of looking and combining on the one side the macroeconomic aggregates and the entrepreneurship profiles. Uh, we have Spaniards, I mentioned. Um, most interestingly, uh, these two, uh, Caballero and Egaña. Uh, Jose Maria Caballero was an Andalusian commission merchant, uh, sugar and tobacco dealer in New Orleans. He is involved in uh, trade between New Orleans as, a, as, a, as an intermediate destination between Europe and Mexico. 
but then he incursions into the uh, local economy of Louisiana as a sugar and tobacco dealer. So he very rapidly diversifies. Uh, Juan Ignacio de Gaña, this guy, this guy here, uh, was also a commission merchant, but eventually starts reinvesting some of his profits into the local economy by becoming a planter and owner of enslaved people. As for the Germans operating here, we have also commission merchants specialized in, intermedi in intermediating trade between US and uh, Europe uh, and Mexico. Uh, they are bringing in a lot of goods uh, to the US Northern, um, US Mexican borderlands, uh, mostly goods that are going to be needed by the miners in Mexico. And uh, well, an interesting example is uh, this guy here, Frederick Willem Smith, uh, who is from Saxony. He becomes a consul for Hamburg and he is operating a, an import and export a firm with his brother in New York. There are also Irishmen, Scots, and an Englishman. The Englishman, uh, Ambrose Lanfear, uh, is, uh, is, is one of the agents, uh, rather a minor agent of the Rothschilds from uh, Great Britain, but he doesn't really import that much specie. Uh, John Burnside, another one of these Anglo-Irish merchants. Uh, he is a commission merchant, so again, a small merchant banker of sorts, who later reinvests in the local economy. He uh, purchases and consolidates several plantations into the largest plantation uh, in, in the Louisiana uh, sugar industry called Humas. And he basically becomes a sugar baron uh, during and after the Civil War. Um, there are French consignees here, um, two brothers, French Jewish uh, brothers, Armand and Michel Heine, who are actually agents of Rothschild Frères in Paris. And so the question that Marc Landreau uh, asked in his book, you know, who is actually bringing the species um, is kind of solved here. Uh, it is these two French brothers uh, they receive an inheritance from their uncle, and then uh, they go on to uh, try to make a fortune in New Orleans, and they kind of did. So um, in the Civil War years, they return to France. They actually become uh, involved in the court of Napoleon III, and, you know, Napoleon III um, ends his reign, but they are basically part of the new haut finance uh, circles of Paris. Um, the daughter of Michel Hain uh, marries the Prince of Monaco and they vote on chateaus. Um, I have looked a little bit into the question of social networks. I don't want to delve here too deeper because I want to take a look at uh, the other side of the coin, which are the American consignees. Um, so most of the American consignees were also commission merchants, but they were also bankers and financiers, almost uh, and actually even, even bigger in their, in their uh, level of sophistication. They, uh, both foreigners and Americans, invest very heavily in real estate and land. And two examples here that I'm going to show um, are Edmund Jean Forstall and James Roth. So Edmund Jean Forstall is a Louisiana and Creole merchant banker. That is, his family uh, was French and had arrived uh, in the French and later Spanish uh, colonial period. Uh, he becomes uh, eventually the agent of Baring Brothers and Hope and & Co. Uh, in Amsterdam. He is more known to historians in the US uh, for having crafted and originated the idea that uh, Louisiana banks needed to be uh, really conservative in their um, in their actions and uh, hold a lot of specie as reserves for uh, in case uh, something happened, as he had lived through a really bad experience of his own in the 1830s for not having enough specie in um, you know his accounts. Uh, then another actor here that I'm going to mention, which is one of the better known to U.S. Uh, financial and business historians, is uh, James Rove. Uh, James Rove is a private banker 
So think of private banking at this period as the sort of shadow banking system that emerges once uh, regulators in Louisiana um, think uh, that these shadow banks can um, help provide uh, financial services to uh, the merchant community in the port uh, after the rather conservative uh, 1840s, uh, shadow banking in Louisiana sort of rises in the 1850s. And this guy here, uh, he is a railroad uh, businessman. He is also an art collector, most famously being known for having owned this um, statue called the Greek slave. He owned one of the most luxurious houses in the city. And the problem was that he really didn't uh, traffic much in specie. And so specie dealing doesn't really uh, affect you in normal times, but not having enough specie in financial panics becomes much of an issue. In 1857, he uh, has taken a lot of leverage. Uh, he doesn't quite go into bankruptcy, but he basically has to liquidate his assets. And one of the reasons that might uh, appear from, from uh, looking at this body of evidence I have collected seems to be the fact that he was mostly in a fiat uh, paper, uh, fiat slash paper, money slash credit um, economy, whereas all the other actors uh, are actually in a uh, specie economy. His house, James Robb's house, is actually bought by the Anglo-Irish uh, sugar planter that I mentioned to you before. Um, from Robb Mansion, it becomes Burnside Place. And so very briefly, my concluding remarks are, uh, you know, how do we write then the history of monetary standards uh, prior to the arrival and the widespread adoption of the international gold standard? Now, one can go with the macroeconomic view, uh, better known uh, as being uh, presented in the works of Bordeaux, Reddish, and others, uh, which is rather a structural story where monetary institutions are exogenously imposed onto actors. The problem with this story is that it privileges European financial centers and like 19th century institutions as drivers for uh, the explanation of what was happening before. And what I argue is that one should actually look at uh, this problem from the perspective of agents and institutions at the macroeconomics of specie markets, as these actor-based stories actually focus on unexplored geographic spaces they reveal to us in a better um, way how uh, international bimetallism and prior to international bimetallism, the Spanish-American uh, silver peso standard worked and might give us insights into how the rise of US and British and i.e. Anglo-American uh, Atlantic uh, hegemony over finance and trade in this period came to be. So I'm gonna leave it there. Uh, thank you all for um, listening to my presentation, and I really uh, am waiting for your um, comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manuel, for this great presentation. So we would like now to open the floor for questions. So Kyle Jackson, please. Hi there. Thank you for this uh, fascinating talk. Uh, I'm currently working on a dissertation about New Orleans and its Latin American connections, so this is going to be uh, invaluable for me. Um, I was wondering to what extent you think the desire for Mexican specie is a motivating factor <clears throat> in the many uh, military actions going on in the region throughout this period, many of which were, of course, launched out of New Orleans. Um, most famously, of course, like, you know, the Texas Revolution and the U.S.-Mexico War, but then all these other smaller filibustering efforts and the uh, annexation attempts of Tehuantepec and Cuba. I mean, to what extent do you think that the, uh, the, the drive for hard species is an actual sort of geopolitical factor um, in terms of the region? You know, that is a really fascinating question, Kyle, and I would like to talk to you more about your own dissertation. Um, as I have moved on to entrepreneurship, I have looked at some of the uh, more interesting political and slash military projects of, of the consignees and 
several of them, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're aware, James Rav had um, correspondents in, in Havana who kept him appraised of what was happening there in terms of uh, many rebellions and invasions of American filibusters and, and Cuban rebels um, trying to make their way onto uh, Cuba and basically an exit onto um, the United States. Uh, then some of the Mexican, um, I, I, I need to correct, some of the foreign uh, residents in New Orleans who are doing uh, Mexican um, import and export trade are actually behind uh, the projects to uh, basically uh, fund a rebellion and this revolt would bring uh, the richest uh, mine, mining uh, area in, in Mexico, namely the, U the, the, the north, uh, onto a republic of its own called the Republic of Sierra Madre. And this Republic of Sierra Madre would basically become under the protection of the United States. Now, evidently, this needs um, further investigation in other archives as I have privileged um, my own research into the construction of this data set, it does bring to um, us the, the question of, well, how can we better understand these people? And then that leads us to a reconsideration of New Orleans as a place uh, critical for um, the connections between merchant communities of not only New Orleans, but rather Latin America and the Gulf of Mexico and what some historians call the American Mediterranean. Now, um, they really didn't need to annex either um, Cuba or, or Mexico, right? Because of the uh, intensity of the trade between the regions. Uh, so I guess my intervention is to say that species flowed, species flowed in abundant quantities. And so we have to start thinking about New Orleans as uh, a central place, not only for the export of cotton uh, from the US to Great Britain and other places in Europe, but rather as the central marketplace for what I call the Gulf of Mexico economic region. Well, I certainly agree with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Gita Patel, please. Um, hi, Manuel. This was a fabulous, fabulous talk. And one of the things I've been tracking actually uh, from when the Spanish arrived in the Americas is um, the kind of species that allowed the movement of trade um, across the Indian Ocean, right? So, um, and I was thinking about the, the, the images of Mexican uh, silver on, on notes from different regions, right? So one of the things that was very clear was, um, and there's a bunch of Newton was involved in, in this when he was master of the mint, was that the only species that was accepted globally was Spanish, right? Literally both gold and silver. So it makes me, it makes me, I mean, I work in an earlier period, prim, you know, late 18th, early 19th century, because it's a, it's a cusp period. But 1857 is an interesting point because it's the, the first war of revolution in India and it totally changes the structure of the cotton trade. So I'm just, you know, one of the things you made me see, because obviously, the Germans um, uh, are from an old Hanseatic family, right? So there's a there's a continuation of very early trade routes into what you're bringing to our attention by focusing on players. But what it made me see, because I've been looking at um, late uh, 19th century specie underwriting British bonds, because mm -hmm. the bonds, nobody wants to buy them. But what you're making me see is something really interesting, which is, um, that in fact, through this traffic, through New Orleans, Mexican specie might have been responsible for underwriting the fiscal uh, sort of solidity of the UK, right? And yes. therefore, for Indian Ocean uh, fiscal solidities. So, you know, it's, it's it, I hadn't even, I mean, I, I, I've been curious about the, uh, the Spanish doubloon trade, right? But what you're because of the connect and because of the connection between cotton and silver, and the continued, you know, uh, sort of refusal to actually trust British silver, right? It's possible that that 
I mean, and I know that uh, Silva from um, from the from Mexico and from Latin America actually sort of be, continued as part of the underwriting of notes, right? Right. So, and I've been tracking the ways in which cotton people who sold cotton uh, from uh, U.S. Um, plantations actually um, sort of underwrote notes in Britain, brought brought species back. You know, so I've been interested in that the species transactions, um, and also in in sort of East India Company notes being sold um, in the Americas, right, as a way of garnering species when when nobody wanted to buy their notes um, in India. Um, you know, basically corporate. Uh, state corporate bonds. So you're just, I mean, you've just opened up the story for me in a really interesting way. And, you know, be just, I mean, this is not something you'd include because your 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 work is regional, uh, but it's interesting to think about what, what it would mean if you then tied um, the Atlantic to the Indian Ocean through Me a Mexican species. Yes, yes, this is absolutely right. Uh, to this date, I, I do think that, um, you know, several historians have looked at the roles of uh, silver uh, coming in from Great Britain and France to settle the balance of trade with India and China, right? right. Now, the question is, uh, how and how was this uh, species arriving mm -hmm. in from uh, species less or species less uh, than abundant Europe? Uh, and, and the question is actual, you know, if you if you trace the networks, you mm -hmm. find that these uh, European and U.S. Northern and U.S. Southern merchants are bringing in this this, this species from from Mexico, and this becomes quite fascinating also because I'm looking at the Atlantic side of it, but yeah. the Pacific side is actually also very important. Now the yeah. problem there is that we don't really have uh, the kind of uh, newspaper sources. Uh, for an earlier period, we have it uh, from 1848 onwards, mm -hmm. but uh, one could theoretically do this um, exercise um, mm -hmm. and replicate. And if one could replicate, then we would definitely look at other ways in which uh, Mexican silver is making its way uh, to China and, uh, the, uh, and, and India in this period. And 1857 is absolutely critical. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, even, even on from the Crimean War, uh, yeah. The British are really, really um, worried about their species supply uh, from from the U.S., but they're actually not that worried about New Orleans because they know that they can source species, and their uh, creditors can pay them. Sorry, their debtors can pay in um, in species rapidly supplied from Mexico. They are worried about the the north the northern uh, U.S. Uh, counterparties uh, who might not have as much species readily available. As they need, as the British need that species uh, to, uh, you know, conduct trade with uh, their Asian partners. So this is definitely part of that story. Uh, mm -hmm. It is a regional take, but uh, yes, it is. It is absolutely right. Thank you. And I track a little bit of the early period and uh, through the Pacific because um, I work with. I, I'm writing on free mariners. Yes. Uh, also looking at you know there are a couple of stories obviously and several of them end up in debt but also looking at stories written by merchants in madras uh the place that funded yale right <laughs> through pepper yes so actually in this in yeah it's a, i mean it's a great story thank you for it. i i'm really i'm really happy to hear this talk and i'd love to read your dissertation you know? thank you Thank you. Uh, you will be, I mean, I mean, it's the few people who they will. <laughs> but yes, I, 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 I'm, I'm thankful. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, comments. So, Manuel, I have one question. Uh, so we can wait for other questions. So I was wondering what what kind of relationships these consignees had to develop with the intermediaries who were shipping uh, the species to New Orleans? Because, you know, I, I don't know much about the subject, but I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that shipping species is very costly and it's the insurance must must also be very costly. So you, you kind of need to ensure the quality of the species you are receiving. But since they are most of the species, uh, since you were like mentioning this, um, that are being exported from these ports in the Gulf of Mexico are smuggled into these ports, how, how can they 
ensure the quality? Is this, and, and if these relationships that they develop are, are one way to ensure the quality? Thank you. One way to ensure the quality of the species imports or one way to, 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 to uh, ensure the quality of the coins? In, of the coins. Okay, so then uh, this is part of the, 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 the the, the other side of the story, which I developed in another uh, dissertation chapter has to do with how uh, British merchants particularly, and some Americans actually become uh, the leasers of Mexican mints in this period. So right after the wars of independence, uh, the Mexican dollars, the Mexican silver pesos become uh, quite controversial because they are not being minted up to the standards of the colonial Spanish American pesos. And the way in which, you know, the merchant networks of uh, Great Britain particularly take care of this problem is by leasing the mints from the Mexican provincial government, from, sorry, from the Mexican government and it's uh, on, on both on the national and the state uh, slash departmental level. And this is how they actually, you know, take care of that principal agent uh, relationship. As to the question of how, what, what, you know, what the role of smuggling and contraband and legal trade uh, is. So uh, historians up to this date have, have said, well, we have no, no way in which we can measure this, right? Because uh, contraband by its own, um, by its own definition, is trying to not leave any traces of it. Now, the interesting part is that uh, these imports are actually registered in the newspaper for insurance and customs, uh, i.e. fiscal purposes. So the, the question is then, contraband can be measured, uh, albeit indirectly, once the American and foreign residents in New Orleans get their money in get their, get their silver money in, in 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 Mexico they ship it from Brazo Santiago which is an American port by then and they do that and they register those imports because they are insuring that species and they have to pay their customs duties in specie so uh, that this gives us an insight into how intense this contraband trade uh, by uh, the US Mexican borderlands was and I think it's a methodology that could be you know, taken to other places where contraband trade was actually um, important. I, I, although obviously in, in those regions that have enough species to, to merit it being recorded. And, you know, uh, insurance at this time uh, of species uh, as, as registered in the source uh, costs about 2% of the value. And so, yes, it is expensive, but okay. think about the roles of species, right? Specie basically allows you to leverage it and issue uh, even bigger amounts of paper monies backed up by that specie because of fractional reserves and all of that. So it might have been uh, expensive insurance, but it's not as expensive considering how much profit you can make in as far as other agents know that you can rapidly source specie. That's really fascinating. We have an additional question from Kyle Jackson. When you mentioned the smuggling through Brazos de Santiago, does your evidence suggest what that contraband species was being used for? Is it mostly just manufactured goods or standard commodities, more sensitive cargo like armaments and ammunition, enslaved people? Like you say, it is hard to track, but do you have a hypothesis? Uh, yes, that is a really good question. So Brazo Santiago is a port that didn't exist prior to the Mexican-American War. And uh, that after 1846, 1848, uh, it becomes the leading uh, place, uh, you know, registered in the source uh, as exporting silver. As to what kind of contraband and imported goods that species uh, was paying, it was some armaments and ammunition. There is a lot of political instability in Mexico throughout most of the 19th century from independence in 1821 to the rise of uh, Porfirio Diaz in the late 
1780s, 1880s. Um, so Mexicans need a lot of uh, ammunition and weaponry to fight their own civil wars and rebellions and conflicts. There are a lot of uh, commodity, no, no, there aren't many commodities. The Mexicans are exporting commodities, but they are bringing in imported goods uh, and luxury goods uh, for the wealthier um, merchant families in Northern Mexico, who are actually later becoming industrialists. And they're also importing some um, necessary goods for the mines. As the mines weren't close to any manufacturing centers, they require imported goods and it's cheaper to ship them uh, across the Atlantic and introduce them from New Orleans onto Brazo Santiago and then onto Northern Mexico, rather than ship them via the US North uh, and then on to St. Louis and then, uh, you know, the other, other road of, um, of um, it's called Tierra Adentro. Um, so yes, those are the characterizations I have been able to make. Now, this is an argument also for uh, historians of uh, several literatures and, 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 and countries to read one another. Uh, the same consignees on the New Orleans side appear in fiscal Mexican sources as importers and payers of customs goods. So we do have the necessary um, microeconomic kind of evidence that can provide us insights into how the people in New Orleans who are importing species, they're actually triangulating trade between Mexico, uh, the US South, Europe, and the US North, and Cuba. <laughs> Thank you, Manuel. I was wondering if we have one last question. So if we don't have any more questions, I would like to thank Manuel again for this great talk. And to remind you that our next session is on June 7. It will be a paper by Gary Richard, Richardson and colleagues on payment crisis and consequences. More details are in the chat box. Thank you so much and have all a good day.